this morning with us. My name is Carl Demetria, one of the cadets for the Foreign Service Officers Cadetship Course Batch 30. It is my honor and pleasure to be your host for this morning's event. Today is a great day to come together and learn from each other as we welcome you to this month's Ambassadors Lecture Series. The Ambassadors Lecture Series, or ALS, is a platform for heads of diplomatic missions in Manila to share their knowledge and expertise, experiences, and advocacies. It aims to build stronger bridges of understanding that will lead, lead us to insights, actions, and a deeper appreciation of our relations to continue achieving our shared goals of cooperation, economic development, and peace. To officially begin the program, allow me to introduce our guest lecturer for this morning. Our speaker for today is the Ambassador of Mexico to the Philippines. Ambassador Daniel Hernandez Josef has been a member of the Mexican Foreign Service since 1982. Throughout his career, he has held a variety of positions overseas, notably as the Mexican Ambassador to, to the Hellenic Republic from March 2017 to December 2022. Moreover, he has served as the Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy of Mexico to the United States of America, Consul General of Mexico in Boston, Massachusetts, Head of the Consulate of Mexico in Laredo, Texas, as well as the Deputy Head of Post at the Consulate General of Mexico in Austin, Texas. Within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he has held various positions, such as Director General for Protection of Mexicans Abroad, Director General for Protection and Consular Affairs, Chief Advisor at the General Directorate for North America, and Deputy Director in the General Directorate for Latin America and the Caribbean. Ambassador Hernandez Josef holds a bachelor's degree in international relations and a master's degree in Latin American studies. He speaks Spanish, English, French, and Greek, and he is married. To share his thoughts on Philippine-Mexico relations today, challenges and opportunities, please join me in welcoming on stage the Ambassador of Mexico to the Philippines, His Excellency Daniel Hernandez Josef. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, this is it's always a highly appreciated uh, matter to have the opportunity to share one's views, especially now that I'm about to complete my first year as ambassador in, in Manila, and I have a better understanding of what challenges and opportunities uh, our relationship uh, is facing, but uh, let me let me start, and I can't see that. Let, see. let me start by um, telling you first some just general information about my country, and go from there into into our relationship. As you can see, well, our official name is the United Mexican States. This is important because it relates that we are a federal republic, uh, like the US. So we conform by what we call sovereign states. And this tells you about our political organization. Our current constitution is the one established in 1917 after a revolution that lasted precisely between, about nine, between 1910 and about 1917 when the constitution was drafted. Uh, conflicts continued in fact, until 1929. This is a bit of our history in, in nation building process. Uh, today, we are geographically divided in 32 states. That's why we have the colorful map to mark the different uh, states of the country. Uh, so that means politically, each state has a governor and has its own unicameral uh, Congress. So just the House of Deputies. There is no state senate, only at the national level. Uh, the national government is divided, as it is here, and it is in most 
liberal democracies by in three powers, the executive, the legislative, and um, the judicial. The uh, Congress, the, the legislative at the national level, has 128 senators and 500 congressmen, which is, of course, a matter of a lot of political debate and discussion in the country because it seems like it's a lot. Um, the, there's a historical reason for why we have this structure, and this has to do with the fact that for many years, 70 years, we had a, a unique, uh, a, a single party political system. One party always won. So to break that and to grow into an actual democracy, uh, what we did was establish the concept of plurinominal uh, Congress people. That means those who were second and third in the election uh, process would still have a seat in Congress so that all political parties, no matter how small, all pol registered political parties would have some congressional representation. Uh, this is, the debate is whether this is necessary anymore. This is decisions that were made 30, 40 years ago. The question is how, how necessary are they today? So this is some of the things that politically we're debating inside. Our uh, uh, judicial is headed by a Supreme Court which has 11 justices uh, which are selected between, they're nominated by the president but uh, approved or rejected by uh, the Congress, specifically the Senate. And if uh, in one round the candidate is rejected by the Senate, then there's a second, the, the president presents a second set of three, three proposals, gives three names to the Congress. And if all three names are again for a second round rejected by the Senate, then the president gets to appoint a Supreme Court justice. This happens very rarely, but it happened very recently. The last Supreme Court justice that was uh, chosen in Mexico was chosen by this procedure, was twice rejected by the Senate and then the president appointed. This is important to relate because it tells you about the dynamism of our own democracy and the division of powers uh, that, that is quite active and, and dynamic in our, in our country. Where do I point this to because it's not, oops. Do I have the Mexico profile there? I can't see, okay. Now, so we're still with the profile. This is important to us and for me to relate as a diplomat. We are a Latin American nation that is located in North America. There is no contradiction between being a Latin American country and a North American country. Latin America is, in a sense, a cultural historical definition because we are, speak Spanish, because we were a Spanish colony like so many other countries in the Americas. Uh, we share that history. We share so many cultural values because of that. So we are an integral part of Latin America. Geographically, we're located in North America. So in that sense, we consider ourselves our North American country. And this is also important when you think of contemporary economics, the fact that we're part of the North American uh, Treaty, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, uh, trade agreement, uh, and we're we basically integrated very profoundly into a North American uh, market. So our territory is uh, just about two million square kilometers. And our population is 128 million. So as you can see, we have a, a territory that is, I guess, about, uh, about five and sometimes almost six times the, ter the land territory of the Philippines, uh, and um, a population that's just slightly higher. So it's almost the same population with a lot more land. Now, our land is very full of deserts and mountains that are not arable. So the agricultural area of the land is actually quite small compared to the size, physical size of the country. We have uh, 11 metro areas, metropolitan areas that have more than a million inhabitants. So uh, the fact is that we are an urban population. Uh, over 70, 75% of the population now reside in cities. Uh, and this, of course, has an impact in all of the aspects of the way of life of the country. We are a pluralistic society. Uh, we went through all this process of defining 
who is an Indian in Mexico, who belongs to the indigenous original communities. We call them the, the original peoples of the country. And back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, the sense, for the per sense purposes, they would define that by those who wore sandals, the, the traditional Indian huaraches or sandals. Uh, then they said, well, that's not a definition of ethnic uh, relationship. And that, then they changed it to the language, those who spoke an Indian language. But many indigenous communities now have, uh, especially the younger generations, they've lost their original culture, their language. They don't speak the original language, but culturally and in all other aspects, they feel part of their communities and they identify as indigenous. So now the census basically counts those who say, I identify as indigenous. And that, then you're counted as part of the indigenous population. That today is 19% of the population of the country. Uh, and then there's 2% that identify as Afro-Mexican. This is important also uh, because it refers to the challenges that the country has given that diversity. There's over 60 languages spoken in Mexico uh, in this indigenous diversity. We have developed educational uh, systems in all 60 languages. Uh, and uh, so this, is, this has been a challenge for decades as well. Then uh, Mexico is a G20 nation, as you probably already know. Uh, we are uh, in the last uh, uh, calculation of World Bank and F FMI, we are the 12th economy globally in the size of the total economy. We are a member of many groups. Of course, in the Latin American world, we are very strong, very active and have always been, and we're very strongly connected to CELAC, which is a, a group of Latin American Caribbean nations. Uh, but in a wider sense, I point out here, we are a member of MICTA, which is Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia. Strange mix of countries, but if you think of it, one thing characteristic of all the MICTA nations is that we're all G20 nations and we're all middle powers from different regions of the world. And what, that, what this does is it's a forum pretty much of conversation, dialogue, and political consultation, uh, which I believe in today's world, given what's happening in, in, in geopolitics of our era, uh, becomes extremely, extremely useful and extremely important, and it has been for, for Mexico, no doubt. So um, I point out, this is, I think, important. I go back to it when I talk about economics. Mexico is a signatory to the CPTPP uh, treaty or uh, agreement, uh, and that's, that's also very important to us. Now, um, Let's talk about a little bit about the economic policy. And uh, we are an open economy. Mexico has uh, made this transition. And uh, since I've learned about the challenges of the Philippines today and the hardworking, thriving process that you're going, the high rate of growth, uh, it, start, it reminded me of when I lived through this process uh, in, in Mexico. Yeah, mostly 80s, 90s, I would say 90s, uh, where, where there was this, the same sense of energy in the country because the country was, was changing in such a way. So today, this is just general data of today, and I'll go back to this process. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a GDP of 1.4, depending on who you ask, 1.2, 1.4 trillion dollars. Uh, this, this data is 1922 by the World Bank. Uh, our per capita adjusted to, to purchasing, par, uh, uh, purchasing parity, parity is 22,298 US dollars. Uh, the total trade of Mexico is $1.2 trillion. 80% of, of what the part that we export is manufactured goods. We export. 500, this is uh, uh, 2023 data. Uh, we, our total exports were 500 
and 93 billion US dollars, and our imports, 598 billion dollars. Now, what this tells us is it's a very balanced trade. <coughs> Sorry, it doesn't mean it's balanced with all countries of the world, but overall, our trade is, comes out to a very fairly well uh, balanced one. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's a lot of trade. And what this means is that we made this transition from an import substitution system that led us from the revolution in the 1930s all the way to the 1960s and 70s. 70s. Uh, throughout that period, Mexico grew at rates of 6 7% uh, uh, a year. I mean, there was, it was the, rate, the period of extreme uh, growth, economic growth for the country. But the import substitution system wore out. And by 1976, we had a huge financial crisis because the system was just not working anymore for us. And then we went through a period of upheaval of a decade of economic crisis and consequently political crises, which led in 1986 to a total shift and the decision to open up the economy. For those who are or have experience in business, I can tell you this was brutal because the change from a very closed economy to a very open economy was done in a very short period of time and in one blow. And that meant companies that could not compete with the American companies would go broke. Because we were mostly an opening, we have a 3,000 mile border with the US, so the natural beneficiary of our opening markets uh, would be the US. So uh, basically our companies had either to become uh, competitive and, and, and in the good sense, in the positive sense of the word, aggressive in their, in their uh, commercial uh, strategies, uh, or they would disappear. And this was uh, quite a shakedown for the country and for those people in business. But at the end of the road, what happened is that we became uh, one of the most open economies in the world, convinced of the benefits of free trade and open markets, and certainly one of the most uh, competitive countries, uh, which basically is what led us to be part of the, the G20 and has led us to be uh, one of the 10 major uh, participants in world trade. Numbers go up and down. We've been up to seventh in, in the size of our uh, international trade. That uh, one point, uh, that, that um, almost a trillion. Uh, our total trade is about 900 and something billion. Uh, we, we're approaching a trillion uh, a year in total trade. And then I have to point out the dependency. Uh, about 700, about 65% uh, to 70% uh, of that trade is with one single country, is the US. And so we're extremely connected, therefore, uh, economically to the US. And, and our fate is clearly uh, linked to that of the US. Uh, in that sense, I point out um, that we are the United States' first uh, trading partner now. We're followed by China and Canada, but we are the number one trading partner of the United States. Um, then that has brought about foreign direct investment, uh, which uh, in last year was uh, almost $36 billion, and the stock of accumulated FDI in Mexico is $650 billion. Trade with the U.S. is 780 for last year, so that was just like 70, almost 80 percent of the trade is with the U.S., although this figure talks about 64 percent of total trade, and this is because it includes uh, the trade that's basically the result of chains of production and distribution. Uh, in this sense, what we've learned is that in today's economy is your role in chains of production, distribution, and supply is much more important as a country than simply how much you sell and how much you buy and how's your balance of trade. Uh, we are linked to the North American uh, chain. So for example, uh, we're the fourth, 
We're the fourth exporter of automobiles in the world. We're the, I think, seventh producer of automobiles, uh, light automobiles in the world. And yet for an automobile to be on the shop where you go and buy a new car, uh, you can be sure, whether that shop is in the US, Canada, or Mexico, that that car, on the average, before it became a car, crossed the border seven times in parts and pieces. So this part goes here, and then it's assembled, and then it goes, the assembled part goes back here, and then it's assembled with the larger part, and then it goes back to the other part. Because this is, this is taking advantage of the free trade, that there is no, there are no tariffs when the things move back and forth from the border in the production process. And it takes, uh, it takes advantage of the benefits of doing this part here and this part there. At the end, you have a car that is higher quality at a lower cost, and it makes you uh, a more competitive, uh, brings you a more competitive product. This is happening with automobiles, with electrodomestics. We're one of the first, if not still the first producer of electrodomestics, uh, flat screen TVs. Uh, one point is still two years ago, I don't know if this is still true, but two years ago we were still the uh, first producer in the world of flat screens, not only TVs, but for your cell phones, uh, tablets. Uh, and this is again because we're part of this chain of, of production with the US. So in that sense, uh, when you think of what moves across the borders in the process of production, you're counting those that move in parts and pieces as import exports many times. And this is how the figures can, can extend or expand. But the actual trade is about $900 billion. Now, Mexico and the Philippines, finally get to this. Uh, the more important thing for us is that we have a 450 years, let's call it, of linkages, if not of relations, which is really what would be the, the, the more proper word. Whether these are, not, are formal and formal relations in contemporary diplomatic terms, I think would make no sense to, to understand the, the, in order to understand the impact. You know what this means. Uh, 450 years since the Galleon trade, in fact, Next year is going to be 460 years of the Galleon trade. Uh, it's not only the question and the issue of how we together established the possibility of global trade. Because the world was connected around the world from the Americas to Europe to Middle East to Asia, but then not in the Pacific until the Galleon trade. So, the beginning of global trade was made possible because of the Galleon trade, and that put Manila and the city of Acapulco at the center of uh, commercial importance in worldwide trade. Uh, and that also meant uh, that there was a link between the two of us. And I point out Mexico because I know we're talking about the colonial Spain, and this is colonial Mexico and uh, the viceroys and the leadership and the political power and economic power in Mexico was in a sense Spanish. But we, we had a, the Spanish had a classification, uh, basically racial, in the sense that there at the top were the peninsulares, the, which were the, the Spanish born in Spain that for whatever reason lived, worked uh, in Mexico, uh, or New Spain at the time. And the second group were the Criollos, which were their children, children of fully Spanish, uh, uh, fully Spanish descendants who uh, were born in Mexico. And these two groups basically ruled the country and made the decisions. And part of their obligation under the viceroy of uh, the new Spain, which responded to the king of Spain, uh, was the administration of the Philippines. What that meant is that they administered basically the galleon. A lot of the decisions in, uh, uh, regarding the galleon uh, really were not, most of the decisions were not made in, 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 in Spain, but actually in Mexico City and Acapulco. And then there was the informal realities of the galleon, and that is that uh, there were rules. The galleon could carry only so much for its safety, security, and, and so on, and so forth, and yet what on the average, 
historians tell us what was loaded onto the galleon in either direction was usually around two and a half, three times as much as was uh, allowed, and in this one story of one ship that had four times as much. Uh, this tells us that there was more happening between Acapulco and Manila that Spain didn't even know about. In terms of the exchange of goods, people, and with exchange of people, cultures, ways of doing things, and that is the connection uh, and the linkage between Mexico and Manila that dates 450 years. So language, food, music, dance, uh, art, painting, um, and so forth. Uh, the business trade today between the two countries. There's, this is, so I go back to this. Let me just give you the general figures and I'll, I'll return to this. But there's two data that we have. Uh, the data by the Mexican institutions, and that means uh, the Central Bank of Mexico and our uh, Institute of Statistics, is $3.4 billion in trade between our two countries. Yet the data also by your Institute of Statistics and your Central Bank is $1.2 billion. So we have different figures as to how much is actually the trade between our two countries. There is investment in both directions, uh, which I think is, is, is points to a very clear interest in the opportunities from one country and the other. And I'll go back to all of this. Uh, international cooperation happens in the uh, subjects of space, um, academy, academics, paleography, tourism, public safety, electoral processes. I'll go back to all of this. And the other part of our relationship is our shared values and shared positions in, in the diplomatic scene, in international relations. Uh, we are based on the principles of a rules-based world order, the peaceful resolution of controversies, the development through international co cooperation, and non-nuclear proliferation. There is more, but I center on these because I think these have been the most salient ones that bring the Philippines and Mexico together in our diplomatic uh, efforts. Now, uh, the economic relations between our countries, I would want to point out uh, again, there's two sets of data, and I've given you the, the sources. So is it 3.4 billion or is it 1.2 billion? I think this, actually the story of this, which is what I found out in this year that I've been ambassador here, is that we have a lot of work to do in the details. We need to work together in defining, first of all, have the same numbers on both countries, and those numbers have to come from somewhere based on, on what's happening on the ground. Basically, what are we importing? What are we selling to each other? And earlier I pointed out the importance of uh, chains of uh, production, supply, and distribution. I uh, would say the important thing is also to figure out how much of this bilateral trade is connected to these chains, whether it be in Asia or in North America. Because by identifying that kind of information, then we will know exactly where the opportunities of more trade uh, lie. And until we do that work, I think we're sort of, uh, we say in Spanish, giving palos de ciego, just like the blind person uh, trying to find out where, where, where the objects are and where the opportunities are. We need to have a more precise and strategic approach. This is the, uh, one of our challenges uh, for the future uh, and for the future work that we can do together if we want to increase uh, that aspect of our relationship, which is trade. Uh, when I speak of investment, then there there are more challenges as well. Our pri uh, we have investment. The Philippine investment in Mexico is in spirits, mostly by Emperador having bought uh, Domecq. And Domecq had a major uh, presence in, in Mexico, so it became part of what Emperador uh, purchased. So therefore, they have a, a major presence in spirits. 
um, seaport, seaport, which is ICTSI, which has, uh, manages our port of Colima. And Colima is one of our major import-export ports in the Pacific. Uh, all of the logistics administration of the port is under uh, seaport logistics under uh, ICTSI. Electronics, and more specifically, microelectronic components, uh, whereas the investment in Mexico is basically now in two fields, cement and feed for uh, an animal feed. You might have heard cement is really one large, one of our largest multinationals. Cemex, which has a presence here, both right in Rizal and in, in uh, Cebu, and has recently been sold to Philippine interest. They're still going through the process of uh, getting the authorizations, uh, making sure that the sale goes through all of the regulatory uh, uh, mechanisms. But if all of that is approved, then Cemex will probably sell. It will become, uh, it is a Filipino company, Semex Holdings Philippines, but it, the ownership will also be uh, Filipino, won't no longer be Mexican, which reduces the presence of our foreign investment here. Um, I will point out another piece of data I think is very, very important in, in our relationship and what I was saying earlier, how we need to research uh, the details to find more opportunities for trade, and that is the fact that Mexico is the first export destination of the Philippines in Latin America. Here I'm based on the Filipino data, not the data from the Philippines institutions, not the Mexican ones. I ignore the Mexican ones and I looked at what uh, both uh, uh, the Statistics uh, Center and the uh, Central Bank say and it turns out that, yes, uh, there is one Latin American country that has a little bit more trade than Mexico with the Philippines. Uh, if we are 1.2 billion, uh, your trade with Brazil is 1.5. However, of the 1.2 billion of trade that you have with Mexico, over 800, almost 900 uh, million of that is uh, actually exports from the Philippines to Mexico and about rounding it up, 300 uh, million is the exports from Mexico to the Philippines. Whereas with Brazil, it's the other way around in that there's much more imports from Brazil to the Philippines and not in the same proportions, but like a 60-40. So at the end of the day, what you're exporting to, to Brazil is about 200 and some uh, million compared to the 900, almost 900 million that you're exporting to Mexico, at least as of last year. So in that sense, we are the largest market for a reason. We need to do that work. Why? Where are these opportunities? Why is it working for Philippines to sell to Mexico? Uh, in what industries? In what products? What is being sold? What is the demand in Mexico for products that, that the Philippines produces? We need to do that work if we want to further increase. But it's, clearly, it's clear that the opportunities are there, or at least it seems clear to me. Here, I will, uh, I'd like to speak just basically and quickly a little bit more of what I've just be, already said, and that is, uh, what are the challenges? So I'm gathering in this slide the challenges and saying, OK, what are challenges in trade? I've repeated it three times and I'll say it a fourth. Working the data to land on the specifics, the specifics that identify the opportunities for growth in trade. And this is our first challenge. Then it has to do with the legal framework. We don't have a legal framework for trade between our two countries other than WTO. Because Mexico is part of CPTPP, but Philippines is not. And this has been always something that our businessmen and our businesswomen ask. Our business people always asking, well, what is the, the legal framework? In fact, recently we had a request at the embassy from somebody who said, could you tell me what free trade agreements we have with the Philippines because I'd like to have trade with them. My company in Mexico would like to trade with them. Well, we don't have bilateral arrangements. Uh, and this is strange in the sense that Mexico, like I said, we have uh, 12, 13, 14 bilateral, uh, 14 free trade agreements, um, most of them multilateral, some bilateral, that give us 
uh, free trade with 45 countries. It's unfortunate we don't have, the Philippines is not one of them. So uh, it's, it's unfortunate because we could increase trade uh, in, in, in both directions. So we need to work on that, and we need to, if not, at least have, uh, at least at the level of MOUs, have some understanding that gives some uh, certainty for those who want to engage in the business. The business world and the business people, as you know, one of the things they're mostly looking for is certainty. And that happens also with investment. The challenges in, in investment, uh, and I'll go uh, from, well, the first one is this new worldwide global protectionist trend. As was mentioned when they read my curriculum, before I, I was ambassador in Philippines, I was ambassador in, in Greece. So I saw a lot about what's happening in Europe. And shortly before, sh uh, shortly before the uh, pandemic, and Europe was already talking about, uh, about this, but the, the pandemic made it very clear. When the pandemic hit, they depended uh, so much on, on the foreign production of what they consider cheaper goods that they didn't have respirators, they didn't have masks, they didn't have the basic equipment to uh, confront uh, the, the challenge, uh, the health challenge that the pandemic meant for them, and uh, because they could get it cheaply from China and other countries. Uh, but at the end of the day, given the, the global crisis, it was very difficult to get. So they were faced with a challenge that they, they hadn't planned or thought or prepared for. Then came the war and the prices of grain and the prices of, uh, but more specifically, energy and their dependence on Russia and energy brought about a debate about something that they call um, strategic autonomy and say there are objects and, and, and goods and services that are strategic for a country in, in today's world which is so volatile. And they actually, you know, the European Commission is working on which are they and defining them to the point of products themselves. These are the products, this is the list of products. And for them, it's not only about free trade, it's like more important than, than the price of the good, uh, the, how we can get the cheapest one, is how we can assure that we have access. So we will give preference to those that we produce in our region, in that case, Europe. Uh, but we will give second preference to those that are produced in near countries and or friendly countries. Because if a crisis happens, then we, can, we have this sense of trust and certainty. Everyone else, then we become uh, protective. And we start putting uh, some forms of uh, protectionism, usually tariffs, uh, to ensure that this happens, that we supply ourselves on these specific products. It's not everything, but it's these specific products. And then we see, so this is pointing to a new sense of uh, uh, protectionism. We see that also happening in other parts of the world for other reasons, but this is, this is one example. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the leaders of the North American uh, Agreement, the three presidents, the two presidents and the Prime Minister of Canada, met in Mexico. And they agreed that to protect uh, labor, workers' rights, and the interests of the three countries, that they would aim so that uh, about, what was it, at least 25% of everything produced in the three countries would be fully supplied, made by components, parts, pieces, materials, products, prime materials from the region, and uh, that they would, so again, this leads to another form of regional protectionism uh, in the sense that if, to do that, you have to make sure that it's not a question of what's cheaper, it's a question we give priority to where it comes from, what is the origin of the product. Uh, so that, together with the, uh, let's say, uh, basically commercial, economic, and and trade tensions between China and the US, and us being so dependent on the US, has uh, also led to many companies, not only American, I'll get to that, um, have divested 
from China to place themselves in Mexico. Because it, when we say that the input has to come from, from the region, you can have a Norwegian or a Filipino or South African owned company in Mexico, but once they establish in Mexico, they become a, legally a Mexican company. Sort of like what I said, Semex in Philippines is a Filipino company. Well, it's the same thing when they establish themselves in Mexico. So even though the ownership is foreign, the corporation legally is a Mexican corporation, and therefore their product goes under this, this ruling and is considered a, a Mexican product, part of the North American production. So this has become under the concept of nearshoring, and we're right now undergoing a flood of investment. That's why we have that $36 billion investment last year. We expect to have more than $40 billion in 2024 because we're having a huge influx of, of investment because of what's happening uh, with the new protectionist trend. So it brings a nearshoring, friendshoring, and security shoring. From, every, which, from everything that I was describing in the European and also our own regional experiences. So this should not be seen as a, a, only as a challenge, but it's a challenge and at the same time an opportunity. It's an opportunity to invest, it's an opportunity to expand, it's an opportunity to access the largest market in the world, which is North America. Um, and yet the other challenge we have in investment is legal uh, certainty and expediency. We need to have some form of a legal framework that gives certainty to investors when they're going to invest in Mexico, when they're going to invest in, in the Philippines. Uh, we see more investment from the Philippines in Mexico now than we have from Mexico to the Philippines. And I think one of the challenges has to do with the legal certainty. We, in order to take advantage of this influx of investment and nearshoring and friendshoring that we have uh, mostly with the US. Uh, most of this money that's diverting into Mexico is really from the US. Um, we had to have a legal framework internally, nationally, that gives full certainty to, to the investors so that they know, especially the long-term investors, so that they know that uh, they are legally protected and they have legal, legal recourse to protect their investments and that it is a framework amenable and acceptable to them. Uh, we need to have that same certainty for Mexican investment in, in, in the Philippines and that's still for us another aspect of challenge. Now we go to this away from the economic, economic issues because a lot of our relations have to do with other things. Cooperation, and there's a lot happening, especially recently, especially with your administration in DFA today, uh, uh, the, the Assistant Secretary's Office for the Americas is doing a magnificent job in uh, injecting dynamism into our relationship and approaching it from the, the point of view of cooperation. So uh, since our last uh, bilateral uh, political consultation mechanisms, all kinds of doors were opened that are now landing on actual agreements and actual things happening. So it's an agree a bilateral agreement on cooperation on issues of agriculture. Our space agencies have met uh, virtually and have started their own exchange of experiences, information, and cooperation. Uh, academic ones. FSI itself is in conversations with our institute, Matias Romero, our uh, Diplomatic Studies Institute at the Foreign Ministry, to, ex to uh, have cooperation and exchange. Paleography, and this is, I think, very important in many, for many reasons, for the understanding and studies of our identities and our joint history. You have uh, a lot of uh, incredible uh, array of and, and collection of uh, historical documents from the colonial era of the Spanish colony. And what we have both in Spain and in Mexico are experts for, that have studied, we have uh, a little over 100 years of studying these, these documents. So we have experts in the paleography, how these documents 
were organized, codified uh, by, uh, by Spain. But it wasn't just a single one. Uh, each religious order had its own codification. So that makes the whole understanding of the paleography very, very, very complex. Uh, and some of them are not necessarily something that the order would do in Spain, but also something that the orders would do from the new Spain, from Mexico. So uh, besides the agreement that you have with Spain, we are hoping to co coordinate with the work being done between Philippines and Spain so that we have a collaboration between our National Institute of History and uh, your National Archive so that we can uh, decipher uh, the documents that you have, the paleography, and then through the documents trace the, our joint history. Uh, we have one in tourism. We are uh, now in the process of establishing how uh, they will meet uh, virtually to have a first meeting of exchange of experiences, collaboration in the tourism industry. And in fact, the interest in the Mexican side was so high in doing this with the Philippines that they actually said, asked us, could you hold a little bit that day because the secretary himself would like to be at the meeting. Let's hope that happens. Uh, but it is, I know at least that the interest is in, on the Mexican side at that level. Uh, there's a lot of cooperation on public safety and specifically things like drug trafficking uh, between the appropriate agencies uh, of the two countries. And they do it so well that it is, and so appropriately that we don't know the contents of their conversations. We don't need to know the contents of the conversations. What we as diplomats need to know is that the agencies in both sides of the country are satisfied with the level of communication exchange and that it is useful in combating the international aspects of organized crime. So uh, that is going well. And we've started a new one between our electoral agencies. Uh, there was an interest specifically on the, on the side of the Philippines uh, regarding the fact that we have uh, now established uh, online electronic voting for our communities abroad. And uh, this uh, presidential election, which will happen in a week, uh, June 2nd, 10 days, uh, will be the first one we will, when we have electronic voting. Other, until then, it, uh, for our con communities abroad, it's been mail-in vo uh, voting. We have challenges like you do. There's um, 10, about 10 million people born in Mexico that live in the US. And unlike the rest of the population, the majority of these 10 million people are adults, are in voting age, over six, seven million. Add to that another 27, 28 million people additional that are the descendants of Mexicans. And by our law, they have the right to Mexican citizenship. They can go and obtain their documents, their birth certificate, if they don't have one, one will be produced, and then their passports, and then their voting cards. So potentially, there's millions of possible voters. So the idea of you can put a voting, uh, voting poll in a consulate or an embassy uh, might not be very realistic. I'll give you an example. There is uh, one of the largest, one of the three or four largest cities of Mexican population in the world is Los Angeles in California. Uh, Mexico City is the largest city. There's four to five million people in Monterrey, four to five million people in Guadalajara, and about the same number of people of Mexican origin in uh, Los Angeles, perhaps more, and it might be the second largest. Uh, Mexican born population. So there's no way you can have an election based on physical voting in one building for a population of 4 million people. So you, we need to figure out different ways of doing it. These challenges and sharing and exchanging uh, experiences on these challenges, I think, are uh, is extremely useful because we have uh, similar challenges. And we would love to know how Philippines, with a, such a large diaspora, is, is going on about it. Because your diaspora is not concentrated in a single country like ours. It's spread. 
But this is what's happening with our diaspora now. It is growing uh, tremendously in many other countries. Uh, we, we have presence now basically all over the world. So that's another aspect. And now uh, cultural relations. We're also extremely dynamic in uh, cultural relations. We have a cultural exchange agreements that dates back to 1969. And it has been used very actively between the two countries over, over, this, all, over the years. Um, and more recently, through financing from the Philippines, uh, the National University of Mexico, which is called National Autonomous University of Mexico, has uh, now established in 2023, it established a Philippine Studies Center, uh, which is extremely active. One of the things, the two things that they've done through that that I think are important was a major seminar in the city of Acapulco that was hybrid, so Philippines was very active in participating, Philippines institutions, on, on the galleon. Uh, and that was done in October, which is the, October 8th is the day of the galleon. Um, it's possible that this will be repeated this year and that it'll become an annual event. It's a very tangible result of what the Philippines is investing in, in our relationship through uh, this uh, Philippine Studies Center at the National University. Another thing they've done is created the Red Filipiniana. The word red in Spanish means net. So it's a Filipino or Philippines net, uh, Filipiniana net in, in Mexico. And I wrote it purposely with F because that's how we write it in Spanish. And that's the name uh, of the net, which is, was established by this uh, university center. I think this is providing a lot of dynamism to what we're, what we're doing together uh, in the longer term. There is research happening by academics both in the Philippines and in Mexico on shared flora and fauna. Uh, we recently uh, talked with uh, a professor here in, in the Philippines, a couple of professors who are studying, uh, they're most specifically looking at uh, fauna and uh, studying how, which fauna really comes from here, or which, which came from Mexico, which was native to Mexico, or which came to Mexico from the Philippines, and understanding how fauna and the presence of fauna changed in both countries because of the, those 450 years of exchange. There's a professor from Colegio de Michoacán in central Mexico who is now on leave in, in Paris, but has she has dedicated her life to the study of mostly just the history of the Philippines in general. And she has several books published on that, but she's more specifically concentrated on the flora, the plants, which plants came from where and were exchanged to where between uh, the Philippines and Mexico. If you have a chance between now and June 23rd, we have an ongoing exhibit at the Pinto Museum in Antipolo. And over there, as part of that exhibit, there is a, a screen that has uh, a video by this professor. And in this part, she's uh, studying tuba and how the, not only that coconut came to Mexico from the Philippines, but also the knowledge, the technology of distillation, which didn't exist in pre-Hispanic Mexico, according to her uh, research. And therefore, the process of distillation came from uh, the Philippines, and, and therefore, tuba is still sold and is still uh, in some parts of Mexico, specifically in the state of Colima on the Pacific, north of Acapulco, but also how the distillation was used for the production of other goods, and many say even tequila is possible because of the adaptation of the te technology, the technique of distillation into uh, other plants, which would make another connection between uh, Philippines and Mexico that is being researched by uh, uh, academics. Just generally, I spoke already that generally of the impact of the galleon on everything in all of our lives, food, language, many words that end with te, uh, in the foods like achote, camote, they're actually Aztec words. 
This is the Aztec word that we gave in Mexico to these food products. So they are evidence, because they're in the language here, I think they're very important evidence of something else, of the relationship between Philippines and Mexico that bypasses Spain. Uh, one history book in Mexico, which we're trying to translate to Filipino and to English to publish here. Uh, or it was originally published in 1965 by a wonderful Mexican historian, a magnificent writer. Uh, and what, basically what, what uh, he described was that the first ships, uh, the first trip of Undaneta, not the one he did with Legazpi, he had been here before, and probably Magallanes, but certainly that first trip of Undaneta, and then the one with Legazpi. The uh, people that they brought on the ship to take record of everything that was happening were given instructions, mostly by Legazpi, that they would write these logs in Mexican Spanish. And this struck me tremendously, because you're talking 1565 is only 44 years after the conquest of Mexico City by Spain. In 44 years, they had a concept of the distinction between Mexican Spanish and Spain Spanish. And the Mexicanisms and the Mexican view uh, filtered through the language. So again, those who came to the Philippines even originally, yes, the, the Legazpi himself was born in Spain, but he had lived 30 years in Mexico by the time he came here. So in that sense, he was so Mexicanized and he, was, he had this, this influence from the culture because when the Spanish came and conquered Mexico, part of the conquest is not only the question of military conquest, the military conquest they conquered Mexico City, but how do you conquer a nation, a territory of nine million people, which was the population of what is now Mexico when the Spanish arrived. And they intermarried. There was an empire there with a nobility, with social class, with social structure, with educational systems, with engineering. So what they did, they just integrated that. And by the, purpose, this, the process of intermarrying and adopting from the culture of the Aztec Empire, already 44 years later, they had the awareness that they were not in the process of a mixture of two cultures, but actually in the process of the birth of a third new one that wasn't the Spanish culture and that wasn't the Aztec Empire culture. It was a new, the Mexican culture. And they already had this concept. So I found that fascinating because of that. And this, it is the people and the ways of thinking and the ways of doing of that new culture that was being born that came to the Philippines. Uh, so I, I think from what we're doing in cultural relations and, and approaching this uh, from this view is now uh, a process of rediscovery of who we Mexicans are, who you are, through our understanding of, of our roots and our shared roots. I already spoke of the paleography. I won't develop more into it. And uh, just point out, as I already said, that we're working on two MOUs, one between FSI and our Diplomatic Academy, and the other one is just generally on cultural activities. Uh, based on the Cultural Exchange Agreement of 1969, we're negotiating an MOU uh, between the NCCA and the Ministry of Culture, SECULT, uh, in Mexico. Now, I promise this is the last slide. Uh, multilateral relations, and it leads me back to what was on the original slides. The aspect of shared values. Of course we have shared values, because we come from the same people, we're cousins, we come from the same history. So naturally we have uh, shared values. And in, these are translated in uh, diplomacy in a list of them, but I have stressed these, these four because I think they're important to our uh, current situation. A rules-based world order. And this is being challenged in many ways, and Philippines is living that challenge uh, deeply today. This is being challenged everywhere. So we have 
a joint and a shared, at least a shared um, commitment to struggle for, toward the, the, uh, the paradigm that all peace and progress in humanity can only be achieved if we have a rules-based world order. Uh, similarly, as conflicts and controversies in the world continue to grow, we see a new uh, arms race beginning globally. Uh, and none of us can be or are subtracted from it or uh, away from it. We're all involved in it. It reminds us that the best way to avoid the killing and the destruction that war uh, brings is by maintaining the principle, the concept as a principle, that controversies should be resolved peacefully. The peaceful as, uh, approach to solving conflicts. And I am personally an admirer in the, recent, in the one year I've been here in how this DFA has approached this concept in its most uh, salient and most difficult situations, how the basis of what they're doing is clearly, let's do this peacefully. Let's avoid escalation. Uh, but at the same time, let's preserve our national interests and the rest of uh, our international uh, principles. And, and this is something we, we deeply share. And we've had similar situations where we've done uh, the same thing. The idea that the best way to have a global development is through international cooperation. And uh, there are many examples of this, but this is a principle in which I see the Philippines being very active uh, uh, in this year. And, and I won't spend my time giving the specific examples, but th there are many of them, as well as um, what we've been doing uh, constantly. Now we need to find things that we can possibly do together. Uh, then uh, non-nuclear proliferation. With everything that's happening in the world today, this is an extremely important point. Mexico promoted what we know as the Tlatelolco Treaty. The Tlatelolco Treaty, and in fact, uh, the, 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 our, our main uh, leader, diplomatic leader that, that led this movement uh, of disarmament uh, eventually was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize because of, of this effort. What the Tlatelolco Treaty did is it committed all Latin American countries. Way back in the 60s, it committed all Latin American countries to not develop nuclear weapons, to ban nuclear weapons from the region. So Latin America is a nuclear weapon-free region. We've also, also been a major uh, activist against, the, uh, against nuclear proliferation today and for uh, nuclear disarmament um, in the new treaty that uh, uh, eventually, hope, thankfully, uh, was approved in, in the United Nations. So this is something that I think is, is a challenge and a threat to both countries, and we're both active in it. And that's why I point out to another result of this close relationship and shared values uh, between us. Let me close by saying something that I've learned in this year, and that is before I came to the Philippines, all my life I've heard of this region of the world defined in Mexico as the Far East. And it is so wrong. You're the near west from our perspective. If you look at a map, you are west of us. And if the relationship is direct. Uh, if we think of the Philippines and Mexico as a Far East, then we have to go through Europe and the Middle East and other regions and other relations to define and describe how we are connected with Asia, but more specifically with the Philippines. And in 450 or 250 of them with the galleon, 
our connection is direct. It doesn't go through any other region or country. So uh, we are your near east, and, we are, and you are our, far, our near west. And we need to also change our views and how, how we see where we are each other. And I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that insightful discussion on Philippines-Mexico relations today, challenges and opportunities. At this juncture, we open the floor for one or two questions. Please be brief uh, so we can entertain them. Also, please do remember to introduce yourself and your organization or affiliation before your question. The floor is now open for questions. Anyone? Ambassador, good morning. Thank you very much for making time for us. I am Bo Pete Nunez from the Foreign Service Institute. Um, can you please share what might be the challenges or the causes of delay which surround the prospect of a Philippines-Mexico FTA? Could you repeat again the challenges and... Or maybe the causes of delay for the prospect of a Philippines-Mexico free trade agreement. As you have um, mentioned earlier, sir, we have these particular economic driving forces. However, we still do not have that bilateral FTA. Thank you. Well, uh, right now, Mexico is, like I said, since we have trade agreements with 45 countries or 14 agreements, and we're in the process, like I said, also of an electoral election and a new government coming in, I don't see it happening in the very short term or at least not even talks and negotiations. And as you know, a free trade agreement takes years to negotiate. Uh, my sense is that the best prospects is what we can do within the existing organizations. The best challenge, the, the best opportunity for something to happen between the Philippines and Mexico in terms of more, better, stronger legal frameworks for trade would be either you joining CPTPP uh, or uh, us figuring out uh, regional arrangements, perhaps with the whole of ASEAN, uh, where we have a lot of trade as well with, with many other Asian countries, uh, specifically Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, so uh, perhaps that the conversation could begin uh, for a relationship with Asian as a group. We're tending to look more at regions rather than, than bilateral. Thank you, sir. I think we can accommodate one more question. Please, yes, please. Good morning, Ambassador. Jean from the Foreign Service Institute. I'm under the Migration Studies section. Uh, thank you very much for that intriguing presentation, Ambassador, on, the, on our relations. Both Mexico and the Philippines have sizable diaspora communities. Although they differ in their distribution with the Filipino diaspora being more globally scattered and as you mentioned, uh, the Mexican diaspora being heavily concentrated in the United States. Um, could you share some of Mexico's strategies for engaging with its diaspora or perhaps the general goal of, uh, of your engagement and the challenges you face in attaining these? So for example, in the Philippines, we have a growing demographic of second and third generation uh, Filipino immigrants, and now we face the challenge of maintaining those cultural links. Do you have the, would you have a similar challenge, if any? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Actually, if you look at my resume, the question you ask is for a whole other lecture for me. So I'm trying to see if how I can answer this without extending myself too much. Uh, our work with our diaspora be, uh, goes back to uh, the late 19th century. And uh, that's why when we exchange experience and opportunities, we can only look at what we're doing recently, uh, and you can find some similarities. Other than that, there are not many because of what I said, the concentration in the US. It began in the 19th century, as you might know, Mexico was more than twice the territory it is now. We lost more than half our territory in a war to, with the United States. The war ended with the signing of a treaty 
which left many people of Mexican origin that inhabited the land that was changing countries. And this treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, established that their personal property rights and other individual rights would not change. So if you own land or had a large farm in that area, you would continue to own it, just you would be now an, a US citizen, you would not be a Mexican citizen. Well, that did not happen in practice, and there were all kinds of legal tri trickery happening to take the land away from them. Uh, and that's when our consular service became extremely active in the US. It started because at that time in the 19th century, the concept of consular protection was one of the European one of protecting the rights of your investors in other countries so that they wouldn't be treated unfairly by the fact that they were foreign, foreign business people doing business in, in another place. So from that concept in the late 19th century, we said, no, we need to go and protect these, these property rights. That led into uh, a very complex system. Uh, and I can't go into it because there's a lot, but let me tell you that by the late 19th century, we were beginning to try to make census, actually count how many people were where. Uh, and, and we invented the consular ID card that we still use the same name, the matricula. But more than a card, the important thing of the matricula, or matriculation of the citizens was to have a record of who was where so that we could provide services to these citizens. And this was, goes back to the 1890s. The other thing we did in the 1870s and 1880s was we moved our consulates. So what we, we closed Bilbao, we closed consulates in Europe who were there because of the trade importance. Consulates were perceived offices mostly directed at, at improving and, and enhancing trade. And we started closing those consulates to open consulates in places like LA or Galveston, which is now Houston, uh, basically opening consulates where the Mexican community was for uh, protecting our diaspora. And since then, then, the concept of a consulate became an office where you help and, and direct it at the citizens, but not the wealthy traders. Those that were disadvantaged, the poorer people. So we had this concept of consular service as one addressing the, the disenfranchised and the uh, economically challenged, to say, to say it politely, the poor uh, people that were abroad rather than the wealthier uh, business people. And from there on, we've had a series of policies that even include things like education. There were efforts to establish in schools for the Mexican population in the US since the beginning of, beginnings of the 20th century, uh, creating clubs, uh, helping the community to organize amongst themselves, self-help uh, clubs so that they would have, be more empowered to resolve their issues in the United States. It was all addressed at the US because it's all concentrated in, in one single country. And so on and so forth that when you go today to our consulate, we have health windows where you go to the health window and you're gonna get information about how to approach health services in the city or location where you're at. We have education windows which give you opportunities for online education starting from grade school all the way to a university degree is Mexican institutions that provide these services, and we have programs abroad for the diaspora so that if they don't have access to the expensive education, private education in the US, if they don't have access to other forms of education in the US, they can get the Mexican schooling through, through these online systems. Uh, so health and education were the basic, but now we've evolved into things like uh, financial uh, literacy. So we they have courses on how to uh, manage your finances in the country in, in which you are. Uh, and that's developed even further, of course, in that as you empower the community, something happens that, uh, something else happens that I think is very important. This empowered community begins to claim rights of political participation in your own country. So now, uh, for those voting abroad, we're voting for the migrant Congress people. So migrants or, or diaspora will have specific representation in, in, in Congress. 
So it also has a, a political arm. I think I can go on, like I said, and I could take another hour or two just talking about the subject, but generally, I would say that's, that, that's the, the key. Of course, consular protection, the traditional consular protection, which I distinguish from the other part that I just said, education, social services, which I put under consular diplomacy. Consular protection is foreseen in the 1963 Vienna Convention on, on Consular Affairs. And it's a very specific activity that an, it is the right of the state, not of the individual. It's not, there's no, under the convention, individual right to be protected by my country. It's the right of the country to protect their citizens in the other territory. And it has to be your citizen. And there are cases brought before the International Court of Justice that define who is your citizen uh, uh, so that somebody doesn't uh, get a citizenship just to get consular protection from that country uh, that, that's already been handled in international law, let's say. So for those who are citizens, in our case, basically those 10 million people that I first spoke about born in Mexico that live in the US, this, we have legal protection systems. Uh, and specific programs that are multi-million dollar programs, uh, literally. Uh, we spend over $4 million a year, something uh, very sad, but it happens, when our citizens die abroad, and because of our religion and our practices, they want to bury them at home with their family. Uh, we have a very special connection with death. Uh, so the transfer of their body remains when they are low-income people, when they don't have the resources, receive some help from, it's not fully paid, but it receives some help from our consular system. Uh, legal protection. We have very complex systems of legal protection. First tier, second tier, third tier, meaning uh, legal advice. So you can get free legal advice through your consulate. Your consulate will put you in touch with a lawyer of that country, of that place, who speaks your language, can give you a general legal advice for a situation. If your situation is a little graver and you need legal protection, then depending on your situation and depending on your financial, your resources, uh, you might get some further support where we would pay for some of your legal um, costs, all the way to a program that costs more than $3 million a year to keep people from being sentenced to death. The death penalty is quite generally practiced in many states in the US. We don't believe in death penalty in our legislation and in our social and political structure. So be, because we don't believe in it, then we have a program to keep people from being uh, executed. It's not about defending them from, if they committed a crime, from being punished from the crime. Uh, it's just we believe uh, death penalty to be a cruel and unusual punishment. And besides, legally, if later it is discovered that there was an error, there's no redress because the person has been executed. So for many reasons, uh, we have this program that's it's a multi-million dollar program in, in legal defense uh, of our citizens, which is applied worldwide, but 99% or 98% of the resources are spent in, in the US. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Uh, we at the Foreign Service Institute would like to express our sincerest thanks and appreciation to Your Excellency, Ambassador Daniel hernandez Josef, for gracing us with your presence and imparting your valuable insights on our country's relations. At this point, may I call on stage our Director General, Assistant Secretary Francisco Noel R. Fernandez III to award our simple token of appreciation, one of FSI's Publications, Ruen Capules Recreation, and a Certificate of Appreciation. Please allow me to read the citation. The Foreign Service Institute awards this Certificate of Appreciation to His Excellency Daniel Hernandez Jose for imparting.